This is the uh, uh, Town of Fairfield Conservation Commission uh, meeting on uh, Wednesday, May 17th at 7 p.m. Our first uh, 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 agenda item is called to order. We have Kate O'Mahony. We have Ted, help me with your last name. Luxinger. 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 Good. So we have a quorum, four of us. No alternatives are needed to be appointed. And we have all received a copy of the draft of the last meeting. Any questions or any concerns about it? Okay. Let me make a motion to approve that. Ted That's makes a move. Second. Great. Uh, some new business. Uh, we have a presentation from uh, Save the Sound uh, on Water un Unified Water Study, and that's going to be online up there from Peter Linderworth. Peter Linderoth. Linderoth. Thank you. You're welcome. Peter, the, the mic is yours. Oh, great! Thanks so much. I'm happy to be here today. I'm going to share my screen. All right, so can you all see your beautiful harbor? Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. All right, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, my name is Peter Lindroth. I'm the director of water quality at Save the Sound. I'm hoping that you've all heard of us. Um, we're an organization, though, just a quick overview. We're an organization that um, strives to protect and restore Long Island Sound, uh, both the water, of course, but the lands around it. We work in Connecticut. We have an office in New York. I, I live in Greenwich, but uh, I report into our office in Larchmont, New York. We also have an office up in New Haven, and it's a great place. I love working here. Uh, we have lots of uh, different kind of types of people employed with us, different backgrounds, I should say, specialties even. Um, we have a full legal branch. We have ecological engineers that do green infrastructure projects. Um, we've got lobbyists in Hartford and Albany fighting for legislation and advocating for legislation to protect Long Island Sound. We have climate specialists, communication specialists, you know, you name it. We're, we're you know, we're about 50, 50 plus people. Um, and I am an environmental scientist by training and I work in our water quality program, um, which I love. I've been in it for about nine years. Um, I grew up, grew up in Fairfield, actually in, on and around the sound. Um, so working here is really just, it's great to go check into work and really enjoy, you know, every day of what I do. Um, and I'm going to be talking a bit today about the Long Island Sound Report Card and, uh, Southport Harbor specifically, and a bit about our water quality mo monitoring program that you all participate in. And, you know, I won't, if uh, we could take, I'll save some time for discussion. I'll probably talk for 15, 20 minutes tops. But, you know, if you have a question while I'm talking, just please feel free to jump in. I won't take it personal. Um, I'm happy to have discussions around any of these points. Um, but again, talking about the Long Island Sound Report Card and then um, the Western Basin Grade which uh, is the open waters off of a good chunk of the Connecticut and New York coastline, but includes the coastline off Connecticut, uh, Fairfield, excuse me. And then Southport Harbor's grade gets a bay grade. And then looking a little bit into a nitrogen load model uh, as it uh, pertains to Southport Harbor and the Mill River. And then again, just discussion, um, happy to chat and just kind of clarify anything. So starting with the Long Island Sound Report Card, I hope uh, many of you have uh, seen it. Uh, we took a very, friendly handoff from the University of Maryland. And it was actually 2015 when we got the handoff. This was funded by the Long Island Sound Funders Collaborative. The University of Maryland uh, Center of Environmental Science um, had already put out a Long Island Sound report card, but it was determined that we really wanted a group that was working locally, regionally on Long Island Sound. So, you know, we responded to an RFP type thing and put in our um, proposal and uh, we became the home of the report card, which we really enjoy putting out. It's a uh, a document that's developed for lay people to pick up and understand. It's a, it's a report card looking at environmental health um, and, it, and it assigns grades. So it's A through F, green through red, um, but it's based on abundant, really high quality data. And the background behind the grading is a whole different presentation for another day, though you're welcome to ask me about it. Uh, involved, you know, numerous, basically two years um, year and a half of meetings with stakeholders from, you know, the EPA, from both state agencies, uh, local municipalities, uh, nonprofits to determine, you know, how are we going to assign these grades? So when I go and we start looking at grades, I just want to be really clear. This wasn't a metric that Save the Sound developed on our own. 
and then applied to data that's out there and data that was subsequently collected. It was very much uh, developed in partnership with many, many stakeholders around the sound, which is crucial to its success. Otherwise, it'd be really, it may not have been as well received as it is, right? So we had a, a lot of consensus and even where we agreed to disagree, we did so in a way that really enhanced this report. And so these were the, la uh, not the last three, but these were the first three report cards we did. You could see we do it biennially. So every two years, 2016, 2018, 2020, our design team took a little spin on it updated the cover. You can see we have a thing for lighthouses. Um, and I'll talk more about that shortly on the one that just came out um, last October. But to be clear, the, the data that fuels the report card, um, we have open water grades that are fueled by data collected by the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. They have decades of open water data funded by the Long Island Sound Study. Um, the Interstate Environmental Commission, that's a group that focuses in in the western portion of the sound and New York City waters. We're looking at the maps of stations on the screen. Hopefully it's not, I didn't see how big your screen is. Hopefully it's not this little square, but um, so deep stations, IEC stations, and then New York City Department of Environmental Protection does abundant water quality monitoring data um, in the Western Narrows. Um, and for us, the Western Narrows is defined by Throgs Neck to Hellgate. Um, and they have some really great water quality data. They have actually over a hundred years. And of course, methods have changed over the years, but they have a really outstanding, one of the longer standing data sets for um, environmental health in the Western Sound. And so these groups are all collecting dissolved oxygen, uh, many, many parameters, but for the report card, dissolved oxygen, uh, water clarity, and dissolved organic carbon, which is a nutrient indicator. It's much more stable in the water than say total nitrogen. Um, so we use that and then also chlorophyll A. And I know I'm talking to a group that's somewhat in here. So, I mean, hopefully I'm not getting too in the weeds, but again, just let me know if you want clarification on any of that. But open water grades coming from these data sources. And so the Bay grade data, when we adopted the report card, the initial report card had data from the open water that would kind of be, you know, these, these, there's over a hundred embayments, right? Bays and harbors in Long Island Sound. And they were sort of just lumped in with the open water data. So, you know, you're looking at deep stations. They're obviously in open waters of the sound, which is very different than the shallow waters of Long Island Sound uh, for many reasons, but think, one being that there's seaweed in shallower water where the photic zone goes to the bottom and there's not seaweed really in the middle of the sound, right? So that's just one big difference. But um, we determined right away that we were going to cut the bays and harbors out of the grades and develop a water quality monitoring program that could fill those shallow water systems around the sound with data collected specifically for the purpose of assessing environmental health in shallower waters, Southport Harbor being a really good example. Um, so ample open water quality um, data and this unified water study, I shouldn't use an acronym the first time, but you're all participants. So the UWS, it fills the margins of Long Island Sound with really um, high quality data that many groups are collecting. And this is a map showing where we are and, and a little bit of the history too. I mean, it's been active for more years than this, but this is just the last three years of growth. Um, 2021, we had 24. So just to put it into perspective in 20, 17, we had three groups, really brave groups that piloted this work. And, you know, I like to think I'm a good salesman, but, you know, they were eager to get involved too. And we develop procedures, we find, find, you know, tune the procedures, also working with people that weren't just on the water doing this uh, monitoring. And then fast forward to 2021, we were up to two dozen groups and 41 embayments. In 2023, we're now in 27 groups uh, and 46 embayments. And you can see we have coverage from all the way out to you know the Connecticut Rhode Island border and Wickedy Quack Cove and the Stonington area, all the way along the Connecticut and Westchester coastline into New York City waters, and then Nassau, pretty much every embayment in North Shore, uh, Suffolk. So lots of groups participating, and we're all including the town of Fairfield, um, and we're all following the same project plan, the Quality Assurance Project Plan. Some of you might be familiar with that. It's a uh, a technical document that we author and administer. Um, and it's a requirement because this is federally funded. So the Unified Water Study, 100% federally funded now. It's a $1.2 million a year program. Um, and with that federal funding from the EPA, we one of the requirements of many is that we develop a quality assurance project plan that their quality assurance officers approve. So this is like a 250 page document that you know Tim and Tom can give you all. They've, they've read it and memorized it, I'm sure. Um, but it's a very technical document and it really outlines every small procedural step 
a lot of it's for us on an administrator, us as the Save the Sound to administer this work. It's all of our data checks and how we submit data at the end of the season and all the way down to the instruments that are being used. Very important document. The monitoring season is six months, May through October, and all the groups are collecting what you're seeing up on the screen here, the tier one water quality data. So dissolved oxygen turbidity, which is just another word for water clarity, uh, chlorophyll A, which is a measure of phytoplankton in the water, very tightly linked with how much nitrogen is making its way into coastal waters. Qualitative macro macrophytes, that's just a fancy way of saying like a none, some, lots assessment of seaweed. And then temperature and salinity. So all the groups, all 27, are out collecting these data. And then a subset of the groups also collect continuous dissolved oxygen data. So that's a gear that goes out in the water for six months and takes readings every 15 minutes for six months for dissolved oxygen. Video surveys at the bottom, how much seaweed coverage is uh, in a percentage uh, format, and then nitrogen and phosphorus sampling as well. All of this is being collected, I should mention, to uh, using the same instruments. So we administer an equipment loan program where we take, we have 27 multi-parameter SONs, for example. Those are the probes that go in the water to do dissolved oxygen, turbidity, and chlorophyll A. Um, we loan them out for six months, and then we take them in and do long-term winter storage and maintenance on them before loaning them back out. And it's not just the SONs, though. It goes down to GFF filters and syringes and buckets and rakes. I mean, really, we provide everything a group needs including funding. So a lot of that $1.2 million, a pretty good chunk of it, is distributed out to groups um, to fund their staff and their boat time and such as well. So October, we released the 2022 Long Island Sound Report Card. Here are all the um, data providers. You can see Town of Fairfield Conservation Department, um, but lots of other different types of groups as well. We've got Bronx River Alliance, Cleanup Sound and Harbors. It's like a 100% volunteer group in Eastern Connecticut. Director Shipyard, I think you're familiar with them. So lots of different types of groups that um, Maritime Aquarium being another great one. All of them are great, really, but you just get the spectrum of the different types of groups that are participating in this uh, monitoring effort. I won't go into this in great detail. It probably looks pretty small to you, but again, I hope you pick this up. It's a four- uh, four fold documents. So we have, you know, an executive summary. What's the unified water study? We took a lot of time writing about, well, not a lot. I mean, it's three paragraphs, but breaking down a pretty complex issue in climate change and what it means for Long Island Sound's future, especially in respect to um, environmental health indicators like dissolved oxygen in the water. Um, and then a place where people could take action. We're not a doom and gloom group by any means. So we want people to see this. And if they're not happy with what their grade might be, these are some things that anyone really honestly could do. And then we have links where they could get a bit more in depth to look at some of the more advanced things that people can do to protect water quality or restore it. This is the inner part. Um, it's a fourfold, and I'm going to show a, a blow up of it, but hopefully you pick it up. I'll, uh, Tim, I, I should send you a few so you can keep them up at your office if we haven't yet. Um, but each of the open parts of the sound is uh, you know, named as a basin, so Eastern Basin all the way into the Western Narrows. Um, and then we have trends for these. So over 14 years, we we will comfortably, in this case, with open waters apply trend, like statistical trends on those data to say like how that particular basin of the sound is doing. And then the bay grades are the unified water study data, and that's um, on this page. So zooming in on what this looks like, um, kind of to be expected with Long Island Sound, there's an east to west gradient in water quality in the open water. See how we've pulled again, the bays and harbors are not included in the open water grades. When we had adopted the report card, like for example, this yellow would have extended all the way into all of these, you know, Greenwich Cove and all these um, embayments. And it's really not a great reflection of what's actually happening in them. So we pulled them all out right away. And then we started filling them with these bay grades based on the data collection I was just talking about. But for the open water, the east to west gradients, pretty well established. I mean, open water in the eastern, eastern basin here is flushed pretty frequently with Atlantic um, ocean water, which is coming in and kind of flushing out pollutants, bringing in fresh um, ocean water, respectively cleaner. Um, I won't even just say cleaner, but just, you know, it's not estuarine waters, it's ocean water flushing happening here. There's also much less population at, out in the eastern portion of the open sound, uh, frankly, way less wastewater treatment plants, for example, um, discharging their millions and millions of gallons of um, treated effluent, which still has nitrogen in it. And then you go central basin, 
the largest portion of Long Island Sound, lots of flushing here, lots of water. And then as you move west, you can see, I mean, the grades start to decline. And I mean, some of that's geographically driven. There's just not as much flushing. There's not as much um, exchange with the Atlantic Ocean, but there's also a, obviously a lot more people and showers and toilets and such that are just in septic tanks and whatever it may be, impervious coverage, um, adding to this kind of poor grade in this section. Um, and you can see it doesn't always follow the same uh, trend, we'll say, with the bay grades, right? So we have Wickety Quack Cove. This is number one over here. It's getting a D. It's got, this is an example of an embayment that has like three feet of Clodophora. It's an invasive seaweed, nutrient loving seaweed. Um, and it really, it's, it's a eutrophic system. It has excess nitrogen very clearly impacting water quality. And that's like our easternmost bay. You know, generally speaking, as you go west, you do see more and more problems in the bays and harbors. But there are issues, I mean, Black Rock being another example here, where um, they actually have poorer water quality than the open sounds. And it can actually, it can happen either way. Um, I wanted to focus in on the Western Basin and the Eastern Narrows. If you pick up the report card, the Western Narrows is actually showing some, it's an F and it's still an F. Um, but in this particular report, we were able to identify some statistical trends in the right direction. But Western Basin and Eastern Narrows, Western Basin being, you know, here's Southport Harbor, um, kind of off the coast of uh, Fairfield. Actually, that's not so. Yeah, uh, off the coast of Fairfield, um, we have a B plus and a C. And, and this is a, a portion of the sound that's kind of been in flux. We, a, a couple of years ago, we issued a report that showed that this was showing some significant improvements, um, but, this, this latest report card with two more years of data show it got more into a variable state. That's what this squiggly line is showing. So it's an area that we know we need to continue to advocate to get back to the gains that we want to see um, continue to happen. And uh, it's a B plus, but this C grade for uh, this, that's what this yellow grade with the fishes is, is for dissolved oxygen. And that's troubling. We want to continue to see that improve. Eastern Narrows, same thing. It actually had taken a big step forward from a, a D kind of F range into a B and then knocked back kind of back to a C. So, you know, it's, we're seeing improvement, but this is a really good example of climate change impact, warmer waters, um, literally can't hold as much oxygen. And also we just wanna make sure we're not resting um, on our advocacy and such for the open sound. Still a fair amount to do for the Western sound. I point out that the report cards on Sound Health Explorer, another great uh, tool, uh, and I don't just say that because we developed it, but it's a great tool. Um, it has our fishable grades. This is the Long Island, it's just the digital version of the Long Island Sound report card. People can go in and really dig into the indicators. There's different layers like impervious surfaces, um, land cover usage, uh, up 12 USGS watersheds, et cetera, that people can turn on and look at. And you could go into more detail. So this is Southport Harbor. Um, and then I just wanted to point out this again is generated by unified water study data. So, you know, Tim, Tom and that team are out collecting from MIL-01 through 04. And uh, those data fuel the grades for Southport Harbor. Each embayment, there's 200 and I think it's like 296 stations that we monitor. Um, and each embayment has this grid that was assigned to it. And uh, the same station selection process to avoid any bias or try to get as, as representative a sampling as possible. Um, so, digging in Mill River, Southport, we've made sure to put Southport Harbor in there because when you look at the boundaries, it really is the harbor, but it does um, have influences, obviously, from Mill River. Um, so, this is the last grade 2021 data fueling the 2022 report card, and it gets a B minus. So, not a terrible grade. The, p the previous couple of years, there were some C's. Um, so, there's some room for improvement, um, but there are other embayments that are worse, and there's some that are better. So, you know, in looking at these data, you can see that um, dissolved oxygen is an issue. Um, there's hypoxia that's forming in Southport Harbor um, annually. And hypoxia, you know, that could be temperature driven. There's some interannual variability that comes into play, um, but you really don't want to see hypoxia in your embayment, right? Any embayment in Long Island Sound. Um, so it did get a poor grade for uh, dissolved oxygen, and that's tightly coupled with this seaweed grade, which is C. There's been some other years that it's been lower. You know, growing up in Fairfield, I see the sea, I remember seeing and still see that sea lettuce, that green seaweed that's somewhat abundant in Southport Harbor. That tends to be a really nitrogen loving seaweed. So if you're seeing a lot of green seaweed, sea lettuce, also called ulva, it can be indicative of excess nitrogen. 
We assign challenges based on um, metrics too. These aren't just randomly assigned. Algal blooms being a result of the C grade and in some other years, the chlorophyll grade is also a C. Um, and then septic systems based on a nitrogen loading model that I'm gonna show you. So we, we identify those as two, including climate change, three of the top challenges for Southport Harbor. And I just wanted to show what hypoxia can look like. It's really, it's acute, right? It's not a chronic hypoxia issue. I wanna be clear that even though that grade is an F, that doesn't mean, and you all know this, but Southport Harbor is by no means a dead zone, um, but it is basically not meeting um, in that regard um, criteria set forth for dissolved oxygen, right? So not a dead zone, but this is just one example. This is what, September 29th, 2021. I just took that day's data that was collected and you can see this is dissolved oxygen, uh, red being 2.33 milligrams per liter. You probably are all familiar with this, but anything under three is uh, termed hypoxic, hypoxic. Up to five is sort of a zone that you don't wanna be in or the water, we wanna keep the water out of, I should say. Above five is clearing like interim goals for management. Um, so this is just one day. I could have, and I wanna be really clear about this. Um, there are other days where there's no hypoxia, plenty of them, right? But since this is really a, an acute issue, um, we look at the days where it does exist and where it is present. So you can see MILL1 was hypoxic. And then this is pretty standard with these kind of um, inner portions of embayments having um, lower dissolved oxygen than the outer portion, similar to the open sound where the eastern portion is flushed more with a sound Atlantic Ocean. MILL4 is flushed more with open sound water. And so tying that to something, because again, we're not just here to just, and, and that's not the point of this conversation whatsoever, um, but we're not just, you know, poking at things. Um, the watershed for Southport Harbor Mill River, as you all know, because I know you issue watershed plans and such, is it's a large watershed. Um, so it's a lot of land draining into Southport Harbor, Mill River, Southport Harbor, and with it comes, you know, human pollutants. It is what it is. We live in a developed world. Um, so this is just a quick snapshot of that watershed. And I put it here because you know, excess nitrogen is a leading pollutant impacting environmental health. And as I mentioned, this is a, a nitrogen loading model or nitrogen load model that identifies sources. And we, um, this is uh, by a partner, Dr. Jamie Baudry up at UConn, Dr. Yarish and partners. You can see them all down here. It's a great resource put out in 2016, still pretty relevant, um, where you can select any of those bays and harbors around the sounds and uh, get a lot more than what I'm showing here, but you could see the percentage of uh, the nitrogen sources loading into the water. And so for Southport Harbor, 45% of the nitrogen load is coming from fertilizer. 36% is coming from septic systems. So this green portion here is fertilizer, the gray is septic. So those are two areas to consider. And I'm sure, I, actually, I know I've read about things, so it's happening. So this isn't to say the town of Fairfield is not doing anything about this, but those would be two areas to continue to chip away at to improve water quality at Southport Harbor or to continue, you know, going on a trend going um, up towards an A. I'm sure it could get up to an A. Um, so reducing those sources uh, would go a long way. Um, atmospheric deposition to the watershed, that's just a term for saying stormwater runoff. So reducing impervious surfaces goes a very long way for improving water quality. That's just scientifically proven. Um, but the Mill River watershed, I think it's only like 12% impervious coverage, but you, it is important to look at you know, within 200 meters of, say, the harbor. So while the watershed extends really far up and we wouldn't expect it to be super high in impervious coverage, that immediate 200, 300 meter around the harbor can have pretty significant impacts compared to like, you know, a couple miles away. On the golf course, I heard that. Um, so, and obviously, I mean, you can see it in the map here. So, you know, I'm not fully aware of what this golf course practices are with fertilizer. But, you know, it is right on the harbor. So, I mean, that'd be an obvious place to look as well. All right. So with that, you know, happy to take any questions or comments. I, I just want to point out again, it's really a pleasure working with the, the town on the Unified Water Study. I hear up to about year four or five now in the program, and uh, it's a lot of fun working with everybody. So I could take some questions if you have any, or if you want to um, have any discussion points, happy to bring the slides back up too. Any questions? Anyone? Good. All right. I, I think we're good. I, I do have one question regarding Satan Sound. Yeah. How is that organization funded? 
Yeah, we get that question a lot. So we um, individual donations, our membership, um, you know, over 5,000 members. We also have, you know, donors, different levels of donors. So private, you know, donations. We take in a fair amount of money from foundations, so non-government funding through grants and, and other such things. So the Long Island Sound Report Card, for example, funded by the Funders Collaborative, Long Island Sound Funders Collaborative initially. Um, but we also bring in government grants. Um, you know, my department brings in you know, about 1.2 million a year in government grants. The ecological restoration team, I think they're up to about 4 million a year now. And that, that's for things like rain gardens and bioswales and green infrastructure projects. Um, they're really great at getting shovel ready projects to the uh, government and locking in those grants, which in those projects, dam removals, for example, that go a long way to improve water quality. So it's a, it's a mix, lots of different types of uh, funders and funding sources. Any questions from anyone before we thank Peter? It sounds like we uh, now why we have to encourage less use of all this fertilizer. Yeah. yeah. Really talk yeah. To I'd be so, curious, you know, what you're all doing um, now. You know, different towns have different ordinances. You know, some push for organic, some have certain, I think, especially with municipal um, properties, right? So, there's ordinances and such that you might want your residents to uphold to, and then there's schools and there's parks and you know rec areas and other such places. And you know, those would be some pretty good stretches. Uh, maybe there's public golf courses. I'm not really sure in Fairfield if you all have public or at least resident public golf courses that's to look into. Private golf course is the one that's right on the harbor. Well, yeah, there's the private one, right? It's the one that's right on the harbor, right? So maybe the town could be leading the way as an example. Is that what you're? Yeah, I think it's a, I think, you know, you have really capable people in the town and, and putting things forward on municipal properties is goes a long way for encouraging residents to do the same on their own. And, you know, when you're talking with residents, you're looking for a collective impact. You need a lot of people to buy in, right? It's not just a few, um, but some of those larger um, golf courses and properties can make a pretty big impact right away. You know, we have uh, some initiatives at Save the Sound where we'll give uh, like documentation to homeowners and we try not to go overboard with this stuff, right? Try not to get too technical, but all the way down to like a one pager they can share if they have a landscaper that says, you know, what kind of fertilizer are you using? You know, I'd like you to use fertilizer with a zero in the middle with no phosphorus, for example. And I want you to only apply twice a year. You know, I don't want you out there every two weeks throwing down fertilizer and some people just, you know, it's not, and then there's homeowners that are taking care of their own yard too. And it's just, they're not totally conscious that you likely don't need as much fertilizer as people are using, like mulch your grass clippings, mulch your leaves, you know, just having initiatives like that can go a long way as well. So, yeah, I'd encourage you as a conservation commission and, and with your staff to, to lead the way, you know, lead the charge. Great. It's your Peter. birthday. Other thing we can talk about. All right. Peter, thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. I'll see you guys. Thanks, Peter. Good have day. Good night. Great. Peter. Uh, next on our list is a presentation from Salvatore Massiello. Massalo. Massalo. I don't put a mouth, mouthful. I go by Sal. Salvatore is, <laughs> is our guest yeah. tonight regarding uh, Master Naturals program request. Thank Salvatore. You. Thank you. Thank, thanks for having me. And this is a tough act. Well, I don't really have a presentation. I just wanted to briefly introduce myself and the program and uh, uh, talk about. Um, might be of interest for information. So, um, yes, I'm a Fairview resident. I've been here for 10 years. I live by him and I moved from Italy, hence the last name, uh, in 2014. And uh, we live by Brookside Drive, the uh, uh, St. Moritan area. Uh, have a, uh, a background or an interest in conservation until recently. So with with, uh, with COVID, I had more time, uh, kind of a rewiring of uh, interests. And I took uh, more of a passion in uh, going uh, to, to Springer Glen and Riverside Park, which are really close to my uh, to my house. And, um, uh, you know, took an interest in birding. You know, I, I think many people were in the same shoes as me uh, a few years ago. So uh, recently, uh, I applied to a, a, a master naturalist program that is organized by the, uh, the Goodwin Conservation Center. It's Good Goodwin Forest. It's up uh, by stores, uh, and it, it's funded by DEEP. I, I know that I'm not in part of totally funded by them. 
it's a 12 month program that it's called master much to my surprise i was i was uh uh accepted it i don't have a you know a, a, a formal education in any of these topics so i what i have is a beginner's mind and uh a lot of enthusiasm but the the, the, the master program consists in 12 months of uh virtual education and, and it's a field uh, a program so we'll, we'll, we'll be visiting uh different uh habitats all across the state the purpose is it's a very group of people coming from different areas of connecticut so it's it's kind of trying to encourage uh, you know different perspectives and uh uh also i guess uh encourage uh, stewardship of the environment but the two requirements i wanted to uh, uh, mention today specifically are um a uh, phenology project uh, for which i i had to pick uh, a location and I picked Springer Glen because it's right by my house and I have to, you know, take observations frequently. And then, um, and so that's a 12 months um, program that will, or, or commitment that will make me be there all the time basically for the next year. And then uh, an, an outreach program or outreach requirement. So uh, volunteer service, 30 hours, and uh, um, I have to. Uh, come up with a, uh, a project of my own choosing. So I uh, wrote to Tim. Uh, we had a brief conversation in his office, and uh, so my idea is since I, I I will be in Springer Glen very often to observe, uh, you know, um, changes in the environment throughout the year, uh, and uh, you know, I, I'll, I I I'd like to do something. Uh, I I will have to do something, but I also would like to do something for. The place that I that I love so much. Uh, I wanted to discuss with you some of the ideas that I had for this uh, volunteer service and see if any of these seem you know better than others or if there is an interest in pursuing one uh, topic rather than another. So uh, the, the the glaring issue with uh, any of the open spaces that I've seen is invasive species. So uh, uh, one of the things that that could be done is uh, try to organize, coordinate a group of volunteers or, you know, uh, maybe get some uh, directions from this commission and from the town on you know, what are the priorities and what are the best tools to use, um, what species to target, what's the best time. I'm probably thinking that maybe it's not something that can be started now, but since it's a 12 months horizon, maybe it's something that can, I can plan for the next um, for next year, for the spring, next year when we are beginning, like thinking March, April of next year, maybe. So that would be number one. Um, um, alternatively, uh, you know, the trails are in great condition, uh, but I think that maybe we could benefit from some labeling, some kind of education um, trails, maybe a trail map or some kind of, or at least some signage that maybe would. There's a lot of dog uh, dog owners and now some some runners. But you know, sometimes it's all it takes is just uh, a label or something to to keep the curiosity and maybe foster a little bit of care for the place. So that's another idea. Um, what else? Uh, um, those are my 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 top two. Um, uh, yeah, education trail, trail, trail maps, uh, or invasive species. So um, I welcome your suggestions and uh, um, and uh, uh, obviously, you know, I I have time to dedicate, so I'm not asking for anything but directions and and uh, and some uh, you know uh, pointers here. Well, thank you. I just want to add, because I mean, it's a huge. Um, undertaking, and I think anybody, anybody that's shining the lights on, you know, the open spaces, I think it's, it's great. Use them. It really is. Um, I don't know if how much awareness there is or much, you know. Not enough. Uh, yeah, I hear a lot of feedback myself um, about the concern on um, the the just the invasives, the, just the proliferation. But I don't know, Tim. Like a community based invasives management. What do you think? I have, to have some experience yeah, from yeah, our pilot a, program with Friends of Lake Mohegan. Chainsaw just to go after bittersweet because I hate it um, so much. Um, one thought that I've had, and this is actually very opportune, 
I would go after Japanese barberry. Yeah. All right. And I would go after Japanese barberry across all the open spaces because it has the benefit of reducing the tick population. Which is, you know, and that's something could, that could be messaged yeah. very mm -hmm. effectively to the population. And I think it would be a very proactive activity on part of conservation um, and, you know, getting volunteers together to do that. Why is it? Um, Impact ticks? Yes. Because the, um, the way the barberry creates a microclimate that is very moist, uh -huh. and that is the preferred nesting area for the uh, white-footed mouse, which gotcha. is what carries the deer. The deer that's the vector for the virus. Yeah. yeah, that's the vector. And if you <laughs> reduce, if you reduce the Japanese barberry uh, in an area, you reduce the number of ticks by eighty percent. So just taking barberry away, and then you could take, say, Mohegan. There's that one section where. It's very narrow when you and there's a lot of overhang on either side. Cut that back and put some wood chips down because ticks don't like to cross wood chips when yep. it gets very hot. Yep. Um, they don't they won't cross that. So we could create some barriers. So make it invasive an, an invasive attack along with tick awareness. Um, and I think that's a win win. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good idea. And uh, I, I like the idea that everybody said. <laughs> Probably more people are connected to the ticks than the Right. So the benefit is the tick, and also maybe it raises some awareness that you don't have to spray all the time. Yeah. Because when you spray for ticks, you kill a lot of things other than ticks, right. and the ticks come back. You you know, and you got to you have to remove the environment that they that the white-footed mouse hangs out in. Um, and there's another disease vector now besides uh, Lyme that has just shown up. Um, that's tick-borne as well. So so, that, so for me, that's a well, hey, for something you recorded with your group, Tim. Yeah, yeah. sure. You know, uh, the physical part of removing bayberry sounds nice. Uh, yeah, that's it. That sounds nice, but you know, the public should know what's happening. Also, you know, there should be some type of something on the website about activity or signage, literature or whatever, for you to go out and hack away at library and nobody know what you're doing. Uh, that should be a, a message that goes with that too. Yeah, if you. You have to take a picture of it, otherwise it doesn't happen. And you have to post it and you also have to, you know, let people know why you're doing what it is that you're doing. Um, and, and Tim, we just got that email from uh, Eagle Scout that wanted to do something with respect to invasives as well mm -hmm. um, to align maybe some Eagle Scout projects along. That's one thing I was thinking of when I saw today's agenda, because the, there's some uh, mention of a the Troop 199 project that happened probably last month. Mm -hmm. My son was in Troop 199, and so I know that it, that would give some, uh, you know, extra sense of uh, eyes and arm. Right, the scouts, and I'm also working with uh, Sacred Heart University. Their LEAF, uh, uh, actually LEAF is uh, Fairfield U, but Sacred Heart, their environmental club, and the LEAF uh, club at Fairfield U as well. There's a, a couple of students there that are potential volunteers to, you know, coming up with volunteers is the most difficult thing. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, there's usually a core of like four or five of us that show up with, you know, stuff and start cutting. It would be nice to get a, a larger group together um, if we broadcast it more and made it a town wide initiative. That I, I think that would be cool. I think that would be a great um, proactive thing that we could do as a group. That's very good. Brenda might, Brenda might be willing to give you some that kind of stuff. So, yeah, so, uh, absolutely. But I, I like your idea about the uh, trail marking. Yeah, I was just asking about that. Uh, yeah. Making the place look cared for, and yeah. um, I think that breeds respect. That is, you know, that's a <laughs> right. Most of special. Yeah, most every, when I uh, run into uh, walking at Richardson is lost, <laughs> so they don't know the tr you know the markers are just fallen into disrepair. Yeah. So uh, what what would so how can we take this the, the next? Well, I think what would happen if it sounds like there's a strong interest in both of those topics. But I would suggest that you coordinate it with Tim. Uh, it doesn't require a vote from us tonight or no action from us tonight, but coordinating with Tim, because you obviously part of it would be on, all of it would be on town property. Yep. And have Tim come back and tell us where you're headed with it. Sounds like both of those are great, great opportunities. And and if there's, you know, doesn't have to be one project, doesn't have to be this 30 hours, doesn't have all of everything this year. So it's something that, uh, I'm willing to kind of pursue it as right. in general. So, yeah. and I bet you there's a lot of neighborhood interest too. Yeah. 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 yeah.
but, but the, 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 the space is used, it's been used more and more, but I bet the ticks are, are encouraging uh, this year. I stopped taking my dog because uh, every, uh, uh, every single time we have to I would think that the number of time. dog walkers, that would be a big issue, big issue of interest for them as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So, Salvatore, we'll leave that where you and you communicate with Tim, and Tim will bring us up to date on what's happening. Great. And as Ted said, you know, all of us, I'm sure, are willing to pitch in in one way or another. That's a good little open space, too. Yeah. There's, there's water there. There's, okay. I mean, it's really got we're everything. We're to go through, and, um, you know, there's um, not all of it. Uh, the, the trails only touch a portion of it. Uh -huh. The thing is that there's areas that are more undisturbed. So, it and um, not many people notice it because you know the entrances are. Uh, there's no parking. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, there's mm -hmm. no parking, right? Well, there's parking on you know, Pheasant yeah. Lane. Yes, yeah. yes, but well, you have to kind of you got to know you got to you got to know where it is. Yes, yeah. And to, I mean, to make a difference, if you if you pull the barberry, then you need to have funding to plant a native to take yeah. take its place because. The minute you pull them invasive, if you don't put something else down there, it comes right back. Comes back. Yeah, it comes back, or something else, comes or something else takes its place. Yeah, anything else disturbs. Disturb <laughs> Japanese. There's one more. There's not not the, right. You name it. Yeah. All right, well, Salvatore, thank you. All rats, which is five. Here. All right, number five is old business. <laughs> Moving on to open space activity permit, the application form. And that's your. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, give the commission an update that the form's been finalized. Um, it's now published. Uh, it was run through uh, risk management uh, department, which is part of HR. Um, Peter Ritchie, the assistant director there, made a few changes and recommendations. We adopted mm -hmm. similar um, conditions that were uh, located in Parks and Rec's uh, form. So that is uh, robust now, and like I said, there's a PDF fillable form um, I published on our homepage. Um, and uh, when received for similar projects like we had uh, with the trails race and the radio uh, mm -hmm. radio communication at, at Hoydens, uh, those activities can now be fully permitted um, through this commission as well as circulated for comment and concerns through uh, six or seven other town departments. Great, great. Uh, moving on to bills and communications, number six. Uh, item one under that category is commissioners at Earth Day event. And I think uh, I just want to name some of the people that, that were there. Ted uh, came by and did a great job. Ryan was there with his daughter. Uh, Peter did a wonderful job putting an awful lot of literature together, signage together, put an awful lot of effort into that. Kate was great uh, inter interchanging with people walking by, actually yeah. buttonholing if you were bringing them to the table. Yeah, especially the kids. Yeah, I do love it. Yeah. <laughs> we came back for quite a while. So uh, that's my comment on, on uh, Earth Day. I think it came out great. Thank you, guys. This is a very it was excellent and uh, posted it. Got a lot of comments uh, on Instagram. I took your pictures and put them uh, up on the Pollinator Pathway Instagram as well. I think we were just trying to have a little not fun, but uh, talk about some positive stuff that was going on. Well, well and the awareness don't share, is awesome. Not yeah. too heavy. We could maybe do better next year, but you know, uh, was I thought it was a good start. It was a great start. Yeah. I think it was very positive. It was exactly. things that were adding to the community, you know, like, you know, I thought it was great. So, okay. yeah, we got to insist on a big table next next year. You know, there was some talk about participating at other events that may happen. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's something at uh, the uh, gazebo that's going on that would apply to us, you know, maybe some of us would want to be there with the table or whatever. I can share with you the stuff that we're doing, Pollinator Pathway. We we do t tabling events. Uh, this Saturday, I'm doing a presentation at the Grange oh, yeah. about how to build a pollinator garden, yeah. how to st start a pollinator garden. And we are, we're doing a lot with the museum. Um, they've got a bunch of summer camps and summer programs. I'm presenting to preschoolers tomorrow about Pollinator Pathway. So we're asked to do tabling all the time yeah. um, and that, and, you know, they're aligned, you know, pollinator pathways aligned with conservation sure, under sure. forestry 
because trees are also big flowers and you know mm -hmm. that's how we I learned a lot at that table. Yeah, it's there's a um so I can make the I can make the commission aware of any tabling opportunities we're aware of so right. that right. it makes sense for us to leverage absolutely. Hey, Tim, you know, you should know that I I'm probably a little too uh, aggressive to say we're willing and able, but you know some of us would, would be willing to give up some time to tell the story a little bit about the good things that that you guys do at town conservation. So yeah, try and you know keep the website active with updates. This Earth Day event, you know, I posted the pictures on there. Um, last year, I had had uh, an inquiry with IT um, to for to do a 15 month span of how many clicks were on the homepage, and we're getting about a thousand clicks a month, average. So um, people do see it. I don't think a lot of, enough people see it, but I think, you know, sharing. Is it the website supposed to be upgraded soon? It is. It's it's the contracts signed. I they haven't migrated everything yet. I think that's going to be that should help. late summer. And yeah, to make a, a more user friendly website, especially if that could be linked. If you could, if your stuff could be linked directly to my Insta stuff and, you know, just go back and forth. Yeah, similar like, a, you know, that I created the QR code. Right. To link people to the website now, um, you know, simple things like that. But um, yeah, it's it, it's out there. You know, I, I post something usually weekly, informational or educational. Right. That's what people want to see. Yeah, the, the, the frequency of it that, you know. Well, yeah, I you it's in the hours. That can help with that. It's, you could click on other. Read hers. Um, Right, but she's willing to. Uh, they're always looking for news. Put a link to our stuff in there. Other departments, you know, you can look on the news, and there's no updates, or just it's, just contact info. And, right. Whereas I like to, yeah. show that if somebody clicks on it, that okay. we're active, we're we're still yeah. here, <laughs> you know, we're you know, yeah. So we're coming on strong. Well, I tell you, that's I'm repeating myself. That's why I like the bat boxes because yeah. they're bat, bat boxes are awesome. Space. And that's when I I was dying to go out the next day to see them, mm -hmm. and you know, a stupid dog was dragging his feet. And, you know, I was like, I want to go to the lane for you. Know. Well, I will say, like you know, when I have from a mile away, I have that's the, what I want to see. When I have the kids and the parents out, at, like at Millahall Park, like everybody's like, well, what is that? What is? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it, it is. It, it's a big draw. You know. Yeah. Maybe you could get something on the, the board. There it looks like it's pretty antique. That so that's you know oh at the one so there's a yeah that's going to be a so oh, but the mill hollow park has one that's where we bring the second graders which is like on the other side of that stone bridge it's like yeah. a little pocket yeah. spot there and um it, but also lots of dog walkers in there and people are like well what is that what is that and then you know it, yeah I, I told people when we put it up that there were cameras <laughs> That's all we need. Uh, I was joking. I, I was joking. Whatever you want to put them up there. If if, uh, if any of you guys have a chance, go take a look at the pocket park that's going in right next to uh, uh, Starbucks there on the Post Road that was being put in by the Forestry Committee and Pollinator Pathway, and um, with a lot of help from Oliver's, um, it's going to be beautiful benches and all native plants. That's true. Trees. So it, the planting's going to be done in another week. Ready to go. All right, moving on. Uh, number two on our bills and communication is Connecticut Sing Council letter. United illuminating 115K5 placement project public hearing for July 25 of this year, 2023. Tim, the, just an announcement on that. There's not much it's an announcement. It's uh, it's redundant from the last uh, agency meeting. I uh, just wanted it to go on the record for conservation as well since. Um, both the commission and the agency are uh, are involved uh, with two sites related to this project from UI. Great, great. Number seven on our agenda is legal enforcement actions. <laughs> Number one is 268 Pine Creek Avenue. Uh, Tim, you want to bring us up to date on that? Update, um, working with uh, the property owner, Mr. Wallace, and uh, the first select woman's office um, this issue of uh, deer feeding and parking and um, deposition of material on open space uh, is currently resolved. Um, so good. Um, that's 
that that's it. Just hope his deer don't show up in my yard. <laughs> Number eight, it's a staff report. Number one, reports from our conservation department. And Bishop, that's you. Uh, first uh, bullet item, um, as uh, most of you know tonight, uh, but for the record, um, Tom Course sitting across from me uh, has accepted the uh, position of conservation manager. Congrats. Congratulations. Congratulations, Tom. Most recently. I've been here 22 years. <laughs> so it's uh, this um, in in. Part of my kind of repurposing um, and in some changes updates to the job description, um, the title of former title of open space manager was kind of dated um, since this role doesn't just do deal with open space. Yeah. So uh, it's been tweaked a little bit and uh, we're looking to do the same with um, Tom's former position of crew chief uh, to again, make adjustments to that job description. Create more of a um, um, succession or in a chain of command position where they could fill in in Tom's absence. So that will be um, that's still in the works with uh, HR right now and the union. Uh, that will be coming online soon for uh, you know a, a position. Do you like the job? It's, it's okay. Tim, you want to continue? It's going to be it's going to be a lot more fun. Yeah, Tom's doing a great job. He's getting a lot of stuff done. Yeah, I um, can test somebody's out in the out. We had some issues that needed to be addressed, and right away because he pulled all this stuff for us and replaced a step. So thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, bullet item number two: new open space land acquisitions. Um, for those of you who don't follow what uh, I work with on with the Land Acquisition Commission, um, I just wanted to highlight two parcels uh, that came about um, recently because they add to our open space. Uh, one was an additional acre of uh, of open space added to Hoyden's Hill, uh, which brings the total of our portion, excluding the Parks and Rec portion, to about 90, 96 acres. Um, and uh, a second one, uh, just south of that, um, off the, uh, Merritt Parkway off ramp near Congress in the high ho, mm -hmm. uh, we added a new parcel there, 2.8 acres, um, literally on the off ramp when you're waiting on it at that light, uh, it's all inland wetlands there, mm -hmm. um, undevelopable, but, you know, preserved in perpetuity. Uh, as wetlands. Um, third item, uh, just uh, again at Hoyden's, which is a popular place on this agenda. Um, Tom and I and uh, economic development have met with the History Channel. Uh, we are a contender for uh, a filming of Forged in Fire um, at the barn and uh, Hoyden's Hill open space. So uh, nothing's been decided yet, but thought that was an interesting um, bit of news. They're looking to shoot a TV show there um, mid to late June. So um, if that's the case, uh, they will have our new permit um, application. <laughs> Just tell them to stay away Where from the go. shooting range. And get to, well, that's actually a, a, an attractive piece that gives us a slight advantage because oh. we are going to do some ballistic stuff. Uh, they may use a catapult to throw watermelons and pumpkins across the field. Oh, there you go. Um, so, uh, to be continued. Uh, again, at Hoyden's, uh, had the conversation this week with the Tucker Fund and um, uh, All Habitat, who's a, a contractor, to uh, finally seed the front two meadows at Hoyden's with, uh, as part of the pollinator project. Mm -hmm. um, jointly with the Tucker Fund. Um, the uh, seed mix is, uh, as of yesterday, is uh, being assembled uh, and looking to get that planted um, in uh, the next few weeks. So when that happens, I'll post that as well. Yeah, earlier the better, yeah. Yeah, it's, um, it's dragging because of the seed issue. So 
Uh, finding enough natives is tough. Soon, yeah, sooner the better. It's a famous um, seed guy uh, putting this blend together. I haven't seen it yet, but it will be native, obviously pollinator hmm. um, species. Uh, again, along those lines um, with pollinators, I had a, another follow up conversation with the Connecticut um, manager uh, from Hives for Heroes. Um, I mentioned this before. I think it's a non for profit out of Texas that I reached out to um, that pairs uh, a mentor beekeeper with uh, a US military veteran um, who's looking to get into beekeeping. Um, and uh, we would look to obviously um, help the bees, but also help our pollinator meadow at Hoydens um, with uh, one or more hives. I uh, discussed it with the town attorney and the um, there's no there's no concerns. The the agreement would be a modified uh, lease agreement similar to our sheep uh, or goats that we don't have yet. Um, but that agreement would, up, would apply to the bees. Uh, it would be fenced in um, electrical fence more so for four legged creatures than the two legged kind. Um, and uh, I, I think if that works out, that would, would be a win win. Next bullet, uh, Boy Scout Troop 199 um, with Tom and the crew uh, picking up what they collected. Um, I posted that on the department homepage. They collected a huge amount of garbage from Tidal Marsh uh, along Odam Road. Um, if you see those pictures on the homepage, there's I don't know how at least the full dump trucks. I think I walked there right before the worth of stuff. Uh, Tom and I noticed a ton of stuff in the marsh. I connected with Troop 199's uh, assistant scoutmaster, and um, they were looking for service time. I said it's Earth Day. You know, how about this? And they were all over it. They they banged it out on the Saturday. Uh, we awesome. we picked up on uh, Monday morning and had a huge amount of just Good. just garbage. Um, so it was it was a great uh, great success there. Um, there are uh, multiple Eagle Scouts uh, projects in progress. I'll just highlight a couple of them. It's, um, it, they do a great job, uh, you know, working with working with us and and uh, Tom and the crew. Um, Mill Hollow being the biggest one. Uh, Pranav just finished up last Saturday, two hundred linear feet of boardwalk. Um, at uh, Mill Hollow, uh, the old boardwalk was in disrepair and it was only two planks wide. We've upgraded it to accommodate um, the public in general, but also with um, wheelchair bound uh, kids through it's great. Uh, through the Mill River Wetland um, Program, the River River Lab Program. Got pictures of that? Those are posted already. Okay. Uh, those are on the homepage. Um, next Eagle Scout in line is going to continue that um he's from a uh, uh pranav was from 80 uh, 88 and i believe uh shaitanya who actually came before the commission when we were in that room about the beach cleanup boxes right is now since he was helping pranav out uh on, on this past two weekends um he's going to carry the rest of the project and complete the boardwalk replacement uh, we also have a third one, um, Charlie, uh, who is going to look at um, Lake Mohegan, putting in the six by six marker, um, geolocated marker posts on the red trail. Um, that is, uh, these, you know, these two projects are coming up uh, this summer, nice. next month or so. And then, like we Ted mentioned, an email. we're looking at a, another one. So, um, it might be invasive. Related to invasives. So, the scouts are keeping us busy too. Um, we, you know, creates uh, good progress. We get things done, and uh, the eagle candidates move closer towards uh, their final eagle scout. Badge. It's, it's 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 very cool. I'm going to a uh, a court luncheon for um, an eagle scout who did a pollinator guard at the Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. So it's a little celebration. It's very cool. I have a question. When do I get my Eagle Scout badge? I did a hundred of these. Things. <laughs> you have to appear an Eagle Scout. You're an Eagle you Scout. You definitely, you definitely qualify. You definitely qualify. I don't know. 
the bald eagle showed it. <laughs> and then the last one, uh, we talked about the bat box installation at Hoynes. Uh, there's three in the outer fields, and uh, the newest one at Lake Mohegan is uh, up the upper meadow from the parking lot. Um, so squash. We have uh, we have a few more, uh, another half dozen or so that um, will uh, be replacing some of the uh, existing um, 